Hey folks, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. So what can you do with a 12-inch Newtonian? The answer is a lot. In fact, the 12-inch mirror provides so much light gathering capability and the f4 focal ratio is such a fast uh, design that uh, it's a game changer. It actually is requiring me to rethink my workflow uh, both in my capture sessions as well as my processing sessions. I've had the opportunity to do uh, several captures with the telescope now since setting it up, restoring it, setting it up and kind of dialing it in. And um, there's a lot to learn here, and there's a lot to do to improve um, what I'm able to capture with this. But I still think that the results are stunning. In fact, I'm going to do two parts of this video. The first part is we're going to tour some amazing, I mean, amazing DSOs that were captured on a single frame using this telescope all around Messier 106, uh, the galaxy. And um, then what we'll do after that tour we'll talk candidly, I'll, I'll talk about m my own conclusions that I'm drawing about my capture session as well as my processing um, that uh, will change the way that I, I approach uh, the use of this instrument going forward. And uh, I think this is going to be a great video. I hope you enjoyed. If you love things, uh, astrophotography, all things astrophotography, astronomy, you're going to love this channel, so go ahead and hit subscribe. In the meantime, let's get to the image. You know, when we look up at the night sky, we see stars, some places more bright than others, but buried in that darkness are entire galaxies, just like this one. This is NGC 4220, which is a barred lenticular galaxy that's over 60 million light years away. Now, on its own, it's remarkable, but it's even more amazing when you realize that this galaxy is captured on a pixel area of about 200 by 100 using my ASI 2400 MC Pro and it's the combination of this 12 inch f4 Newtonian reflector and this uh, full frame camera that reveals a much deeper truth about the universe which is that it's absolutely packed with galaxies many of them faint overlooked and hidden from our eyes and even telescopes of smaller aperture you know as we zoom away from NGC 4220, we, we notice how galaxies begin to appear everywhere. These tiny spiral, fuzzy ellipticals, these are all go these ghostly smudges of light in the dark. These are all distant galaxies from hundreds of millions of years, even billions of, of, of light years away from us. Their photons left to reach us well before life on this planet. So, you know, this fact alone speaks to the volumes of what this telescope is able to do. And this is with just three hours of exposure. We're not just imaging with this rig, we're really uncovering the structure, the form, um, uh, 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 and the history of the universe. Now, we see NGC 4248, which is an irregular galaxy that's only about 25 million light years away. And just above it, or to the left of it, we see two other galaxies that seem to be tangled together. This is NGC 4231 and 4232. These guys are over 300 million light years away. And clearly, they're engaged in some kind of gravitational interaction or struggle. They're pulling on each other. The, the arms of the galaxies are distorting the gas. The, the clusters. All this is happening over the course of billions of years. And these images, this image, you know, it shares this galactic encounter, uh, you know, as it was frozen in time. And uh, this is not a, a space telescope that's showing us this, but this is a backyard Newtonian. And, you know, I, I just got to show you a, a, a couple other really cool ones, particularly NGC 4217. This is an edge-on spiral galaxy. It looks like a glowing needle, and we see examples of edge-ons, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, the, the, the night sky. But I think this is phenomenal. This is actually structurally very similar to our own Milky Way. Um, and to give you an idea of scale, look at the, the foreground stars that shine, and, and look at those brilliant diffraction spikes that everybody, you know, well, some people hate, some people love. Again, we, no matter where we pan in this frame, we're going to see more and more of these dim galaxies of all types, spirals, ellipticals, edge-ons, irregulars, and uh, you really just can't avoid them. 
And now we begin to see the outer spiral arms of Messier 106. This is a massive spiral galaxy. It's about 25 million light years away, and it's in the constellation Canis Venatici. And end to end, M106 spans about 135,000 light years, and these arms, they're filled with these soft blues, these warm reds, browns, grays. These are all the stars and star-making gases of this galaxy. You know, at the very heart of M106 is a supermassive black hole, and that's feeding on all this gas and dust, and, and it's actually a safer galaxy, which means that its core is actively jetting out high-energy radiation as it consumes all this matter. And you'll notice, you know, this, the dark, curving lanes that slice through um, uh, the spiral disk. These are the thick bands of interstellar dust that that are responsible for making new stars and and there it's so thick this dust that it's blocking any of the visible uh, light spectrum from reaching our sensor and then look at those bright blue clusters dotting uh, the the edges of the spiral arms those are stellar nurseries and uh, they're only a few million years old and many of these regions are, are, are glowing in hydrogen alpha and O3 and that gives rise to the, you know some of the magenta that you see see uh, here in this image. This is hot ionized gas surrounding these new bar, uh, newborn stars. And uh, even though this galaxy is over 10 billion years old, it's still making baby stars today. And, you know, I tried to create um, a, a kind of pan zoom rotate, rotating effect here to help you appreciate a three-dimensional shape. Uh, of this deep sky object and you know hopefully this provides some sense of volume and motion and um, you know and gives the galaxy much more presence than a 2d uh, representation so you know all of this is just a, a beautiful to behold uh, such an impressive object and on the whole this frame uh, captures so many interesting uh, objects and all of this is made possible uh, due to the aperture of this Newtonian. I have to say, I, I just absolutely love this image, and I know that it is technically not perfect and has a lot of faults, and I'm going to talk about those now, but I, I want to acknowledge that if you're looking to enjoy the night sky, to capture images that you can share with your family, and to invoke a sense of awe in people, um, it doesn't have to be perfect, <laughs> it just has to be good. Okay, I'm going to briefly cover some of the things that I would do differently in my workflow based on my experience with these early images um, and this rig. The first thing is that I would swap out the ASI 2400MC Pro for the ASI 2600MM Pro camera. And it's very simple. The image circle of this rig is better suited for the smaller sensor size, the APS-C sensor as opposed to the full frame sensor. And the other issue is that uh, though the one arc second per pixel resolution or image scale with the 2400 MC Pro is good, I actually think the 0.65 uh, arc seconds per pixel is even better and usable in my conditions. I'm a Bortle 4, Bortle 5 uh, uh, site, so I think that the ASP, uh, APS-C camera with the finer resolution and the smaller field of view is a better choice, period. The next thing is that I need to fix my backspacing on the coma corrector. I have the Bader Mark III uh, coma corrector, which has a backspacing requirement of 55 millimeters. So that's from the 
corrector lens to the surface of the sensor. I'm roughly 55 millimeters right now, but when I inspect the corners of the frame, I still see elongation radi radially outward uh, of the stars, and that's a clear sign that I don't have this dialed in. So that must be dialed in. Now, the third thing is that um, whether this is with the 2400 or the 2600, this f4 focal ratio is so fast that we really do have the opportunity to play around with the gain and the exposure settings. Uh, for information purposes, I shot this image using uh, a gain of 140, offset of 25, and I used 120 second exposures, two minute exposures. Um, easily, this could have been shot at gain zero and probably the same exposure setting, and I would have gotten a little more dynamic range uh, out of the image. The ASI 2600, I believe their magic gain is 100. That's where um, you know the noise is a greatly reduced, the read noise. I'd, you know, I, I, I'd like to try, when I try the 2600, I'm gonna try different exposure settings, different than what I've used in other rigs, where typically I'm shooting at f5.6 to uh, all the way up to f10. So much slower systems, uh, most of my experience is with much slower systems. And then finally, um, what I would really like to do with all of the imaging uh, with this telescope is to make sure that I'm using narrow band filters as well as my RGB um, uh, filters. In this case, this is a one-shot color camera that I used. Um, and so and I'm not getting any of the hydrogen alpha, the O3, or at least very weak signals in that space. And the result of that is a very inky background. And this becomes really clear when we look at some of the star clusters that I've shot. but. In reality, the, these backgrounds aren't inky black. They, they are full of all sorts of gases in our own um, uh, galaxy. And I actually think it adds a lot of depth uh, to the photo, to the astrophoto, if you can capture some of that, uh, some of that signal. Okay, in terms of processing, uh, look, uh, you know, th th there, there's so many lessons here that I'm not going to, you know, go through them all. But I will broadly say that, that the number one thing is to demonstrate more patience in the, in the processing of this data. When you have such a light bucket and you have so much signal, a uh, good signal, uh, you really should invest additional time in the processing. For those who are curious, the workflow for this was really straightforward. I used Cyril for my stacking and uh, then I brought the stack into PixInsight where of course I applied a dynamic crop uh, followed by a gradient correction. I throw blur exterminator at that. This is all at the linear data. And uh, that kind of gets me to a jump point for my stretching activity. And in stretching, I will generally use like a, a general hy hyperbolic stretch or curves uh, stretch. And I'll concentrate first on intensity, so luminosity of the of the image to make sure that I don't over you know I don't get oversaturated in certain areas, and but at the same time I I bring out signal in the background as best I can, um, and then I usually uh, do a stretch uh, on especially with galaxies I'll do a stretch on the saturation curve itself so I can bring out more color and uh, obviously color is a great way to highlight additional detail in your DSO. So, um, and then once I have that, I'll, apply, I'll, I'll typically apply a noise reduction, which uh, I use Noise Exterminator for. I think it works really well. And then I'll just uh, export that to a JPEG. And, and literally that's all I do. If I spent more than an hour, hour and a half processing this image, I'd, I'd be surprised. Uh, you know, again, you know, in retrospect, perhaps what would would have been good for this image in particular would have been to isolate the stars before I did the uh, stretching and uh, 
and, and some of the color work on the galaxies themselves, that would allow me to kind of dial in those objects um, at the saturation that I wanted. And then independently, I could have stretched the stars using ArcSign, uh, for example, which uh, gives a little bit of protection uh, for oversaturation of your stars, but brings out the colors of the stars. And then, of course, you can recombine the stars with the uh, the stretched stars with the stretched um, uh, background with the DSOs. And I think the ultimate result would have probably been better. Um, but all in all, um, I, I have to tell you, I'm very happy. I, I love my image, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it as well. And I have several other DSOs that I've captured with the rig. Uh, in fact, I have three open clusters that I shot and processed, and they will be the subject of my next video. So if you're into astronomy, all things astrophotography, go ahead and hit the like uh, whatever the button is here, the subscribe button, and uh, that way you'll get notified as soon as that video drops. And with that, I will see everyone on the next video.